So far, we've been talking about Locke's idea of the social contract. You might think, yes, but what does all this have to do with distributive justice? We haven't yet talked about property. We haven't talked about allocating things, goods, or responsibilities of a society. How is all that to go? Well, he does have an answer to that. He starts out by thinking about the nature of property in the state of nature. Even in the state of nature, there is a law of nature. No one shall harm another in his life, health, liberty, or property. So even in the state of nature, it is wrong for people to steal. We have to have a right to our possessions. Even in the state of nature, stealing would be wrong, even if it were not against the law. But now, what does that mean? What is it that makes property property? That is to say, okay, I possess something. Under what circumstances is it actually my property? We think back to the state of nature, and he says, imagine this. Somebody goes off into the woods to gather up acorns. They're going to make a nice acorn stew. I've never eaten acorn stew, but there is actually a recipe for it in The Joy of Cooking. In any case, you go off and you collect these acorns. Now he says, you bring them home, you make your stew, you eat them. Well, at some point, they become part of your body. And so, undoubtedly, at some point, they become yours. Well, at what point? When they're just out there in the woods before you've gathered them, they aren't yours, they aren't anybody's. They don't belong to anyone in particular. By the time they're part of your body, they're unquestionably yours. Your body is yours, if anything is. And so, where did that transition happen? He says, well, what happened there? They were lying on the ground. <laughs> Let's say they fell off the oak tree. Was it then? They were lying on the ground. You saw them. Was it then? You picked them up. Let's say, put them in a sack. Was it then? His answer is, well, yes, it was precisely then. As soon as they're in your sack, you've gathered them. And what made them your property? Your labor. You worked for them. You picked them up. You gathered them. And that makes them yours. Now, that is one way to acquire something justly. You acquire it from nature. You get it from nature. In this case, nobody has any particular right to these acorns. Nobody possesses them. The land, let's say, is just unowned. You go, you gather up the acorns. They are yours. Well, then you cook them and so on. You put further labor into them. Then you eat your stew. But the key point there that made them yours was when you gathered them. It was when you picked them up and exerted your labor. So Locke has a labor theory of property. What makes things in the state of nature your property is your labor. After all, imagine somebody who, as you're off going through the woods, says, well, don't pick up any of the really good acorns. They're mine. What do you mean they're yours? Nobody has a right to claim them like that. Instead, it's by gathering them, by working for them, that you make something your property. But this is not unlimited, Locke says. There are two provisos about what you can gather. First of all, you can gather only as much as you can actually use. You have a right to labor for things and possess them, but you do not have a right to waste them. You can't go through the woods and gather up all sorts of acorns and compile so many, they just rot before you get a chance to eat them. So you've got to be able to use what you gather in the state of nature. And secondly, there has to be enough and is good left over for others. Let's say you wake up early in the morning, you go and you are very energetic. You gather up all the available acorns and that's all there is to eat. And then you demand various favors from people in exchange for some of the acorns. You've claimed them all. No, you're not allowed to monopolize things, even in the state of nature. A monopoly would be wrong even then. So, yes, you can go gather some up, but only as long as there is some left for others. You can't get a monopoly. You can't corner the market on acorns or in anything else in the state of nature. Now, if we imagine a hunter-gatherer society, there's not really much of a problem about this, but there could be, right? There could be if there's one apple tree in the area or one other sort of source of things, and you manage to take that over and monopolize that. He says, that's illegitimate. You can't do it. Everybody has to be willing to share. There has to be enough and is good left over for others. And you can't gather so much that it simply goes to waste. But he says, at some point, people decide to create money as a store of value. And money changes the situation radically. Because all of a sudden now you can trade your excess acorns for gold or silver or something else of value. And at that point, you can actually store up value. 
your excess acorns now don't go to waste. They actually go to other people. And again, as long as you're not monopolizing things, you can actually then exert more effort than is required simply to meet your needs. You can start meeting the needs of other people by gathering up more than you can use and then selling it to other people. So monetary exchange, he says, isn't merely convenient in the state of nature. It actually becomes extremely important. It allows us all to accomplish more, to work more than simply to satisfy our own needs. We can now start helping one another to satisfy wants instead of needs. And so why do we agree to the advent of money and what makes the resulting distributions just? The fact that we agree to it, and we agree to it because we're all better off. Now, if you think, well, gosh, I don't feel very rich. I don't think I'm better off as a result of money. Imagine doing without money and doing everything that you do simply on the basis of bartering things that you've gathered from nature yourself. Basically, imagine yourself as in a hunter-gatherer society. And now, try to figure out how you're going to survive. It would be very difficult. So Locke says, we are all much better off, even the poorest person in a monetary society is better off than in a society without money. It is simply possible now to gather so much more, to build so much more, to create so much more, to cook so much more, and so on, and to help other people meet their desires as well as their needs. In doing all of that, we are capable of then exchanging goods much more effectively, much more efficiently, and the total output of the society is so much greater that the resulting distribution is one we judge to be just. We would choose it rather than choose the alternative. We could, after all, decide to give it all up, go off the grid and become part of a hunter-gatherer society. But how many people actually make that choice? Almost no one. And Locke says that's for very good reason. So what the advent of money does is enable us to create a society that's much more affluent, where many more of our needs and wants are satisfied, but also where there are much greater degrees of inequality. Somebody can now exert energy and get something through their own work that other people strongly desire, and they can become better off. They can store up money. Money doesn't rot the way acorns do. It can be accumulated in ways these other goods can't. So the provisos, at least the proviso about waste, now goes away. People can sell their excess, and there's no prohibition against that. The other one, however, there has to be enough and is good left over for others? Well, within the monetary system, that's not really a problem. Now, there is in the sense that people are not allowed to monopolize things, and so we're still going to guard against monopolies of various kinds, but the idea of monopolizing something is now going to be much more abstract. We're not going to say, wait a minute, you have the best enchiladas in town. You're not allowed to have the best enchiladas in town. You can't monopolize the best enchilada market. As long as you're not monopolizing the enchilada market and making sure nobody else can enter, nobody else can make enchiladas, then what you're doing is fine. Here's how Locke actually puts it. Since gold and silver, being little useful to the life of man in proportion to food, raiment, and carriage, has its value only from the consent of men, whereof labor yet makes in great part the measure, it is plain that men have agreed to a disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth, they having by a tacit and voluntary consent found out a way how a man may fairly possess more land than he himself can use the product of, by receiving in exchange for the overplus gold and silver, which may be hoarded up without injury to anyone these metals not spoiling or decaying in the hands of the possessor. So is inequality a problem for Locke? As long as it's not a monopolistic thing, no, it's not a problem. We've agreed to a system of monetary exchange that makes even great inequality possible. And why did we do it? Why would we now consent to it? Because it makes us all vastly better off.